You know, All of it is common sense. But of course, when people use the word common sense, what they mean is uncommon sense. Because the standard human condition is ignorance and stupidity. <laughs> and so when they say old Joe has common sense. What they mean is he has uncommon sense. So, yeah, why is it that people can't think clearly about investing or decisions in their lives? Well, they don't think very well about sex or gambling either. No, I, the standard human condition is a lot of miscognition. And there are ways to make hay of that or... Yes, you can take advantage of other people. You can improve your own life by eliminating your miscognitions. It's my understanding, Charlie, that you were instrumental in helping Warren get away from focusing on the cigar butt form of investing and looked more towards companies that, I guess you could call them branded companies. Better businesses. Better businesses, right? Yes. Um, how did you help him make that uh, decision? Well, it was perfectly obvious and he'd made so much money in the other technique that it was hard for him to leave something that had worked so well. But it was not going to scale. So when he started looking for investment values in great businesses that were temporarily under pressure, it changed everything for the better. Now we could scale up to the big time. Um, someone told me they asked Warren if he could buy one brand, this was about 40 years ago, what that company, what that brand would be, and he said Gillette. What would that company be today? Coca-Cola. Still? If you take the amount of Coca-Cola drunk in the world and the main flavor, it's one hell of a brand. Now, it's such a different product from this stuff on the internet. I don't have the same. My judgment would not be as good on the internet as it is on Coca-Cola. Well, you mentioned that it would be a bad idea if it got into cannabis. I mean, why not? Doesn't it make sense? Because it's such a wholesome brand and associated with happiness. Why do we want to associate it with a recreational drug. Well, just, no, they they have to grow. I think that would be a terrible idea. What about um, Boeing and the 737 MAX? I mean, they're going to fix that? Would you go on the plane? Gonna fix it. Would you go on the plane after they said it was fixed? Yes, of course. And they will fix it well. But I don't think it was really all that excusable that they made the mistake. That was a serious mistake. Yeah. So then they're still working on it. Yeah, they'll fix it. Boeing probably has the best safety record in the world if you take 60 years. And this was a very unusual lapse. There may not be another one for 60 years. You also mentioned uh, at the meeting yesterday doing um, billion dollar deals overnight with very short contracts. Yeah, we've always done that. Has that ever blown up on you? I can't think of a single example in my whole life where Keeping it simple has worked against us. We've made mistakes, but they weren't because we kept it simple. And that's simple. I would say that the chief advantage that Berkshire has had in accumulating a good record is that we have avoided the pompous bureaucratic systems. We've tried to give power to very talented people and let them make very quick decisions. There's these big bureaucracies, they think the work is done if you get it out of your inbox and into somebody else's inbox. That is not getting it done. Getting it done is when it's done, not when it's in somebody else's inbox. And if everybody's in a big committee meeting all the time, you're worn out at the end of the day and you haven't done anything. Where do you think, Charlie, the biggest opportunities are globally right now? Well, I don't think we have a master plan of knowing where the opportunities are. We're trying to find intelligent things to do with a torrent of surplus cash. And we've always had a torrent of surplus cash. And we're always looking for intelligent things to do with it. And if we find things that are intelligent to do, we do it. And if we don't find anything, we let the cash build up. What the hell is wrong with that? So what is the secret to China's success? They copied Singapore. Which you is, remember, the, the communist leader said, I don't care if the cat is black or white, I care whether it catches mice. And they copied a very wonderful, famous Chinese man in Singapore. And lo and behold, they, they, found, the right, they found the right Chinese leadership outside of 
China, which amuses me. Now, he was Chinese. Who would have guessed that the Chinese communists would improve their big country as much as they have in the last 30 years? That surprised you? Well, they didn't. The first 20 years, they had the Cultural Revolution. It was crazy. And now they have one of the greatest success records in the history of mankind. I don't know about you, but I did not predict it. I want to ask you a little bit about some Silicon Valley stuff. I mean, you said yesterday you were ashamed of missing on Google. Yeah, I am. We could see, if we looked carefully at our own companies, that their advertising was working way better than other advertising. Just we weren't paying enough attention. So is it too late? I don't know. I don't know everything, you know. Well, we'll leave that aside. But, you know, you look at these uh, tech investments. So they're Apple, now Amazon. Did you know about the Amazon purchase? Were you involved in that decision? No, of course not. Um, I've never owned a share of Amazon. I am a huge admirer of Bezos. I think he's been sort of like Lee Kuan Yew. He's a leader that's all by himself. He's, he's been just a perfectly amazing human leader. But it's always been too complicated and uncertain for my particular temperament. It's interesting. And I find other things to do that will work fine. Um, and as far as what's going on in Silicon Valley right now with IPOs, unicorns going public and not having any profitability or any prospect of profitability um, in the near term, what do you think of that situation? Well, there are a whole lot of things I don't think about. And one of them is companies that are losing two or three billion dollars a year and going public. It's it's not my scene. Have you looked? So you're not interested in Uber or companies like that necessarily? Well, I have to be interested when they're that important and sweep the world and change practice. But I don't have to invest in everything I'm interested in. I'm looking for things where I think I can predict what's going to happen with a high degree of accuracy. And I have no feeling that I have the ability to do that with Uber. Right. I want to shift gears and ask you a little bit about um, repurchasing shares. You said in the shareholder meeting, I predict we'll get a little more liberal in repurchasing shares. How much more aggressive will you get? And do you think that's going to be a problem potentially with the Democrats? Well, a politician that's in the business of howling about something, trying to create a sense of outrage, uh, it, it, they're always complaining Do about something. It. But, and it is true that a lot of people, it got so popular to purchase shares that some people purchased them, purchased, repurchased them even when they were too high priced. We will never do that. We're only going to buy them back if they're t too cheap. And, but of course that ought to be done. If you had a partnership of three of your crippled relatives and one of them needed some money, wouldn't you buy out the crippled relative? with the company's money. It's just simple morality. So, But I do think it's being overdone by some people, and it undoubtedly is being done to prop up values, which I regard as an improper use of the share repurchasing technique. Should there be laws about that? No. There are laws, and, and but we shouldn't be telling people what the right price is. Right. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about um, the social safety net we were talking about and Medicare. And do you support Medicare for all? Would that be something you'd be interested in? Well, I'm one of the few Republicans you'll ever talk to that thinks we should have a single payer system, but not one of the type that we're going to get. If you look at the single payer system of Singapore, it costs 20% of what ours cost, and that's an advanced, civilized, high-income nation. And, of course, the people are a lot healthier. Well, of course I'd rather spend 80% less and have the people healthier. And, of course, I'd like to have American manufacturers not have this terrible burden of unnecessary health costs that affects their competitiveness in the world. So... We have an insane medical system that grew like topsy by accident with the help of a lot of dumb governmental intervention. Not all of it was dumb, but some of it was. And, and the system is ridiculous. If a young family has to pay a $5,000 deductible to have a baby, they don't really have medical insurance. It isn't just the Medicare that's wrong. 
the whole damn system is going wrong. And the amount of unnecessary tests and unnecessary prolongation of inevitable death that's going on is a national disgrace. Of course I don't like it. Have you ever thought about moving to Singapore, Charlie? Well, no, but I'd like to move some of Singapore's results into the United States. They have practically no deaths from opioids. They have a low crime rate. <laughs> they have no debt of the whole country. Yeah, no, no, they're doing a lot right. I wish to hell our politicians in both parties would spend a lot more time studying Singapore. But some people say, many people say it's an authoritarian government. There's no, there's a lack of freedom there. It's a democracy. It just does such a good job that the people keep reelecting it. That's, that, I like that result. What the hell's wrong with that? I was with some people um, just a few minutes ago, actually, and they were kind of recounting some of your zingers. Um, do you spend time before the meeting, say, oh, I've got like these six zingers I'm going to get out during the annual meeting? Never. Think of all the people you know that have tried to take one extra step and have fallen off a cliff. Well, on that happy note, we will conclude the meeting. <laughs> Does just come to you? Yes. It, it, I think the meetings work better if they're spontaneous. If we were scripting things, I don't think people would like it. So you and Warren don't say anything at all before you sit down? There? Zero. You have no idea what's going to happen? That is correct. So how did you figure out a lot of people look at your life and you know would want to emulate what you've done? Is that something that people can do? Look at someone like yourself and see your path. I mean, you're in real estate law, then investing. What do you even consider yourself? A businessman? How would you describe what you do? Well, I don't consider myself. A, I think my way of thinking will work for anybody, of trying to be very rational and disciplined. So I think that much. But to flit around to various careers and go into the other fellow's professional territory and try and outdo him and do all kinds of things like that, I think will not work for most people. And so I always tell, I'm always being visited by young men who say, I, I'm practicing law and I don't like it. I'd rather be a billionaire. How can I do it? <laughs> and I tell them, well, I'll tell you a story. A young man goes to see Mozart. He says, Mozart, I want to start composing symphonies. And Mozart said, how old are you? And the guy says, 22. And he says, you're too young to do symphonies. And the guy says, yes, but you were 10 years old when you were composing symphonies. And Mozart says, yes, but I wasn't running around asking other people how to do it. Right. So I think this flitting around business is something not everybody should try. Yeah, I think, I think if I tried it again, it might not have worked as well. You said just figure out I how may to have do been something and lucky. do it. Why were you, you were lucky? Yeah, yeah, I think I had some luck, yeah. Well, but I, I think there's more to it than that. I mean, where were you lucky? Yes, the combination of luck and skill. That's what all good records are. Right. Um, why are we so divided up, Charlie, right now in this country? Well, anger, when you pound on one another, feeds on itself. That's one of the great difficulties with it. It's irrational and it feeds on itself. So I liked the world when it was Dwight Eisenhower against Adlai Stevenson and more civility and Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill got along and, and a lot of it was done. My war was a bipartisan war. And in the aftermath, foreign policy of the United States was a bipartisan policy. I liked that world better. I hate this extreme hatred on both sides. Will we ever get back to those days or get to new days where we don't have the hatred? Probably. You live long enough, a lot of good things happen and a lot of bad things happen. Let me shift gears a little bit, Charlie, and ask you about uh, the U.S. economy. And um, what is your take on where things are right now? Well, obviously they're booming. You know, the economy sometimes booms and sometimes it doesn't. And you have to live your life through both episodes. And our attitude is we just keep swimming and sometimes the tide is with us and sometimes against. And, but we keep swimming either way. Are you surprised by how long this expansion has lasted? Of course, it's lasted a long time. 
But what was really remarkable is that we never printed money so much and spent it so fast and bought back so much debt, public and private. It was total terra incognita in economics. And nobody knew for sure how it was going to work. So was it risky then? Of course it was risky, but it worked. And I, I don't think they had much else that, that would work. They weren't set up to do stimulus. Too much controversy, democratic inertia. Very, so they had to do something. And all they had left was just to print money and start buying things. And that's what they did. And it turned out to be a very wise response. And what's even more remarkable is that both Congress and the presidency and under both parties made the same decision. They all cooperated. It was the last time. But where is that going to leave us, ultimately? Well, it left us licking the Great Recession. So maybe we ought to try cooperation again, since it worked so well once. How much is President Trump responsible for this current economic situation? Well, I think he deserves some credit, but a lot of it just happened. Economic cycle? Yeah. And the decisions of his predators, predecessors. Um, what do you think about the president's um, campaign to lobby the Fed to lower rates or keep rates low? Well, I think presidents have always done this. If you're a politician in a democracy, of course, you want people to print money and spend it. And of course, it's not a good idea. Well, some people now say that federal debt is not a problem at all. Well, if you believe that, you believe in the tooth fairy. Because then we don't have to have any more taxes ever. We'll just print money and live happily ever after. It obviously won't work. So there comes a point when printing money is counterproductive. Are we at that point? Are you concerned? No, I don't think we are at that point. But nobody knew where the point was going to come. And we don't know now. None of these people who are so pompously sure of things because we all want reassurance and so, so they provide it. But nobody really knows how much of this is too much. And do you have any thoughts on Jay Powell and the job that he's done? Well, I think a lot of him. I think he's as good a choice as we could have made. One consequence of this expansion, or actually it precedes that, it's just something that's occurred in our economy over the past 50 years really, has been wealth and income inequality. Yeah. One. Do you see it as a problem? Two, if so, how do we address it? Well, it's a problem if enough politicians are screaming about it. That makes it a problem. It, if it weren't for that, this one will go away by itself. It happened by accident. We were in desperate trouble. We were on the eve of a great recession that could have been a great depression, and then followed by the rise of people like Adolf Hitler and so on and so on. So we faced a real catastrophe. The only weapon they had with this huge, it was to print money and spend it. And they did it. Well, of course, and they drove interest rates down to zero, or real interest rates. Well, of course, that lifted asset values for the people who were already rich. Nobody was trying to make the rich richer. It just was an accidental byproduct of a correct governmental decision made on a bipartisan basis. And since it was a weird byproduct, that occurred in a weird time, it will go away by itself in due course. It will go away by itself? Sure. So there's no reason for... The uh, people that are screaming about it are idiots. It's going to go away by itself. So now that's not to say that we can't raise the minimum wage a little and enlarge the social safety net a little. We should be doing that as we prosper. Both parties agree on that.